That's Reading Awesome, featuring Pat Clark and Mike Walsh. Welcome to That's Riggin' Awesome. I'm your co-host, Pat Clark. And, and I'm my, the other co-host. Uh, the other co-host is my maid and good friend, Mike Walsh. In Mike, your dreams. You? In how your dreams, you, Patrick. I'm Well, I was really good until you came in, but that's okay. But you're doing better now that I'm coming in. Oh, yeah. So tell me about your day. Uh, it's just been another slice of heaven uh, in the engineering world. That's so. awesome. So now we're going to get yeah, to talking good. about... what. <laughs> <laughs> what we're here for, we're going to be talking about a lot of construction topics, right? Tonight, we've got really? a great lineup. I thought we were here to talk about Rubbermaid products, but that's okay. <laughs> like selling door-to-door? Well, whatever you'd like to do. See, I, I wasn't alive in that era when people were selling Tupperware and Rubbermaid products. You died before then? I, was, I wasn't even born. <laughs> well, let's, let's kick off with, with 3D printing. Okay. Okay, 3D printing... It, it came out of nowhere, as far as I'm concerned. A couple years ago, people said, hey, there's a 3D, 3D printer, and I, I didn't know what the hell they were talking about. Well, funny, it came out just before Rubbermaid products, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But, si- but since that time, you know, they started printing, you know, small sculptures and, and, you know, a host of other things. And now we've gone into the age of construction where now you've seen where they're doing 3D printing of, of commercial buildings and brick buildings, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, well, the in terms of, I mean, a broader scope of 3D printing is, I mean, it is, it's become ubiquitous. I mean, you've got it in all forms of different manufacturing. You've even got it in terms of uh, uh, biomedicine, where they're 3D printing uh, blood vessels. They're even looking at printing organs. No shit. Okay, yeah, I didn't know that. so using proteins, and there's a variety of things. But construction being the real forward-thinking industry that it is, um, is somewhat lagging behind. And um, it has started. I mean, the uh, I think one of the uh, early adap- uh, adaptations of this was with the, uh, with the military, uh, DARPA. How so? Uh, trying to come up with means of, uh, de- of constructing uh, hardened shelters. Okay. So, uh, you know, I mean, as a means of, of a r- more of a rapid deployment, and so they started the experiment with uh, basically uh, almost like a shot creating process with uh, with concrete. So, so are these structures that were were really built with the reasoning that hey, we're going to have to move. We want to isolate or get our troops our, our troops on and boots on the ground, and this is the shelter. Yeah, and it's a mo- and it's a more hardened uh, it's a more hardened shelter form as opposed to turning around and sandbagging or some of the other. Uh, I know. Um, I've kind of lost track of some of what since I was in. It's been been a while, but uh, the techniques and technologies that they're deploying, yeah, as far as trying to protect troops and be able to set up a uh, you know on somewhat of a rapid deployment base basis, this fits right into it. So, so right now is is it for the construction use? Is it is it just masonry or is it just is it just concrete at this point? It, well, you've got um, in terms of three D printing, it's predominantly on on the concrete side. Okay. But you've got other elements, and I think we're going to talk about a little bit later as far as uh, how robotics are starting to play into it. Um, But uh, so you've got that, but you've also now got developments in terms of other materials to where, uh, you know, carbon fiber, you know, these types of synthetic materials, plastics and so on that can be actually sprayed Mm -hmm. can be put down in a 3D fashion. Those are beginning to be experimented with, and so now in terms of structural capacity of those and how they can apply. So that'd be similar to like the Rhino lining that you could get for your truck. I mean, that yeah. that spray, but now right. it's going to be printed. It's printed, okay. and I mean, but it's actually to take take the form of structures. And uh, you know, there's uh, you see from a developmental standpoint. I know you were talking about it earlier, as far as uh, Dubai. Uh, you know, what were you saying as far as... Well, yeah, from a construction standpoint, from making buildings commercially, um, as of 2018, these are a little bit older numbers, there, there, was, there was less than 50 prototypes of commercial buildings mm-hmm. in the entire world. Now, Dubai, you know, thinking outside the box, they have a pretty aggressive goal. <clears throat> by, by the year 2030, which is not that far off, right. they expect to have 25% of their real estate made by 3D printing. Now... I don't know what, I don't know what real estate means. Does that does that mean a skyscraper? 
Does that just mean a, a two-story admin building? So that, that brings us then to the next point of different materials. Do you ever see a day where they were able to 3D print with, with molten steel? I don't know about molten steel, but there are uh, there's uh, powdered metals mm -hmm. that can be used. And I think, too, as they start to adapt some of the, uh, uh, you know, along the lines of carbon fiber, reinforced materials, those types of things. Yeah, and I, and I think where you're also going to see this, the uh, NASA has really started to push this with the space program. Because, again, so. well, when you consider that, you know, particularly this long-term mission to Mars or some of the others or even with a, uh, additional lunar exploration and really colonization they're talking about. Yeah. If you have to drag all these spare parts with you, right, and components, yeah. the amount of the volume, the weight, and everything else that you need to haul up. Yeah. Whereas if you can bring up just the raw materials and have a printer there that's able to turn around and spit out multiple parts, it's a it's a much more efficient, much more effective way of doing it. No, and, that makes sense. And I think that's – so I think you're going to see from, you know, from both Department of Defense and then also out of NASA and uh, – uh, space exploration companies, yeah. you know, where you've got, uh, uh, you know, with things that Musk is doing and, uh, you know, Boeing and so Virgin on. Atlantic, their company, their yeah, spinoff company. Well, yeah, but Virgin is more, you know, in the tourism business. And yeah. so I don't think they're going to be as much of an innovator as more of an adaptive reuser or user of what comes out. Yeah. But I think, you know, when you take a look at what SpaceX has been able to achieve in with recoverable vehicles yeah. and everything else. M I mean, Musk is incredible. driving he's driving the fucking market. People are chasing and trying to catch up to him to well, innovate something yeah, before he, he thinks is. of it. Right. Right. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Right. And he's also using some public money in there too, but that's okay. Imagine playing yeah. chess with him. Yes. As soon as you move your pawn, you're you're done. Yeah. You're just well, <laughs> that's okay. I don't play chess. So this is uh So so the two the two companies right now that that at least I've heard of that are doing this are uh, Icon Build, which is primarily in the homes space, residential, mm -hmm. um, and Apis Core. And I think that their their goal is to look more at municipal and commercial. I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more companies sprouting out. Um, I don't know what the technology costs. I don't know what it would cost for you know, mortar or concrete versus, right. like you said, some other type of uh, yeah, the, material. The... Um, you know, I mean, like with any of these things, I mean, and the printers themselves have evolved somewhat rapidly. And I think where you, what you'll see is that um, you'll see companies like Cat, Deer, some of the other big equipment manufacturers, I think, begin to get into this space, too. Because, yeah. again, you know, they're construction equipment manufacturers. They just don't make dozers or graders or excavators. So, it, you know, Speaking of that... Um, you know, we're, we're getting into an age where you're, you're hearing more and more of s about smart equipment. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with smart equipment? <clears throat> yeah, I it, employ some of it. but uh, <laughs> So, yeah, I was going to say, in, in, right. in your space, right. you, you probably have some. Where yeah, we're, we're, we're is kind of a combo engineering and technology company in terms of the application of different different technologies, radars and lasers and that type of thing. Does, does your equipment tell you, though, when something needs to get replaced how many hours you've been using your equipment hey it's it's time to change out this that, this fetzer valve i beg your pardon <laughs> um you should have that removed um the uh no well there's i mean there's diagnostics that go with go with this equipment but where you're seeing it, it, you know, where, I mean, you're really starting to see it like it's on the transportation side, mm -hmm. um, transportation construction, where the days of having surveyors out and putting out all of this lath with, you know, as far as grade uh, establishing grades and so on, they're basically and now just grade checkers are going back. It's uh, you've got this man-machine interface. You've got machine control to where the design is 3D. Yeah. Um, and so with that, that data is being really pumped straight into the dozer, straight into the grader, and through uh, improved GPS, the uh, uh, the machines, I mean, are are becoming somewhat self directed as far as working directly to the plan. Yeah, and that's and that's that that brings up a good good question: is will we 
as an industry, will we be replaced by robots? And and one of the large things is again, let's we just use that example of 3D printing. Well, with the day I had today, I'd be happy to be replaced by a robot. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, be that as it may, it's do I think what you're going to see is you're going to see an augmentation with with robotics. Mm-hmm. So um, that's a fancy word for me. What does augmentation mean? Oh, I thought you meant robotics. Um, the uh, <laughs> um, so it's you're going to you're going to really have uh, workers with some elements of the work performed by these by machines. Yeah, and it's, it starts to get the higher and best use of mm-hmm. time uh, from a safety perspective too. Yep. That you can put a machine into a far riskier environment. Uh, far more hostile environment than you can human beings. Uh, weather? It, yeah, weather the same way. You know, I mean, to go yeah. out and work in 20 below zero weather or, or heat, yeah. you know, I mean, this is um, in terms of being able to maintain schedule, too, because you can push the machine yeah. farther and faster than you can humans. M- machines don't, they, they don't react to heat in- indexes or Well, they or, do, or but chill. not as not necessarily as, as uh, a human. As a human would, right. yeah. So... Um, the, but I think what you're, what you're going to see is that you're still going to have, you're still going to have a need for human, human interaction, yeah. human supervision, mm-hmm. but they're tasks that are going to be able to be replaced. I mean, it, look at it from the standpoint now you've got, you know, these large excavators, right? Yeah. Backhoes. Yep. Okay. Well, you know, go back 70, 80, a hundred years. Those were guys in a ditch with pickaxes and shovels right so while there's been some of that and i think you're going to continue to you're going to continue to see it with some of the robotic like as far as bricklaying is concerned and things like that you're still going to have this human element to it and honestly it's going to in the, on the one hand where you're going to get some benefits as far as production gains and also from a safety perspective um, you've also had a decline in terms of the number of people that have come into the industry and the demands that are there as far as, you know, you look at the projections in terms of uh, population movements that the overwhelming majority of populations are going to be focused in cities. So the built environment that you have to have to support that population density, it's going to continue to drive construction for the next, you know, maybe the next century. And so it's, um, yeah. you're going to need, you're, gonna, you're not going to have the people necessarily to perform the work, and so almost out of necessity, you're going to need to develop equipment to be able to perform it. And, and I and I see I see your point. I still see the need for you know the skilled labor. Um, I, I get that there will be people that will need to repair it, to program it, to tell it to what to do, to maintain it. Right. Again, from a smart technology standpoint, you know you already see it in cranes. You see it in in even smaller machines where. I mean, my God, the diagnostics that you can fucking download. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you can get, you can almost get anything. Right, right. but what you, but, but but part of what you need to look at too is the. Uh, are we done? Um, I just did get a call from somebody very important. And it's not. And it's not. Okay. So, so go ahead, though. So we didn't win the lottery. Okay. So. Um, so it, you know, I mean, in in, I kind of lost my train of thought. No, it's okay. So We're, it's, I was talking about just the analytics and anything oh, yeah. like, like well, KPIs of again a, a, a crane like this back right. here. Well, How many hours just, is it working? Right. Well, it's not just. I mean, you're going to have those types of analytics, um, and there are areas that are going to lend themselves toward being automated. Yeah. And you're looking at it now where there's experimentation with cranes and mm-hmm. using RFID uh, on building materials and that all of the stuff is sorted out and crane picks from a pile, knows where to put it in the building. Yeah. Um, I, the, the development that still needs to be done, I mean, is just staggering. The, the number of variables, the complexity of the construction process, um, and it's one thing if you're building a new building and you're starting from scratch and you can take all of this now, try and go in and imagine having a robot that somehow or another is going to be able, or some type of automated system that's going to be able to go in, read all of the existing conditions and get things to fit up. Yeah. Um, because that right now there's you have 3D and CAD and different programs yeah, and there's still people tripping over each other. Well, yeah. Right? I, I, and, you're, and that's going to continue because, again, the 
you know, you the just the the complexities of this, and it's also going to be a matter of economics that the dollars it may take to number one develop, innovate this equipment mm-hmm. and bring it to the forefront. Yeah. Um, the cost of that versus being able to continue on with human labor. The human labor may be cheaper than you know yeah. than you know than what you're going to have as far as the yeah uh, the development costs in terms of trying to get. There'll be people. companies that cannot afford it, and they'll get squeezed out too. Yeah, um, it, but uh, but I think that I'm ta- I'm talking more over overall as far as industry is concerned that the 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 development costs with the complexity that's involved in this. Um, it's going to be a lo- it's going to be a long slog on this because the it construction almost you know virtually every building is a one off okay um, so you know and you're dealing with different conditions in terms of adapting to site conditions owner requirements and all of these things so but you are seeing manufacturing techniques that are being applied mm-hmm. in terms of now modularization so that you're seeing um, hotel rooms, jail cells, for that matter, are yeah. being actually factory you would manufactured. Know. Well, I so I've been told. <laughs> That's I heard from your parole officer. So, a, a report then, uh, by the World Economic Forum suggested that that by the year 2020, 500,000 people will be removed from the labor market. Do, do you believe that? I, do you see it? Because you're on job sites almost every day. Yeah, but you know, again, okay, this is by what 2025? 20, no, no, no. Like 2020, like Next very 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 soon. <laughs> right. That I'm not I, that I don't foresee happening in yeah. in that short a window. Um, you know, I mean those over, pretty, over those, a period, well, but you get look at it too from the standpoint that I mean for the last uh period of time here, I mean, you've had what uh 7 7 and a half million open jobs and six six million active job seekers so that i mean you've had more jobs available right than job seekers yet right. these jobs are largely going unfilled because the job seekers lack the skills yep. to fulfill these so you know that's what i'm saying that's what i was saying earlier i think you're there's there's going to be an ac- an economic drive it's going to be necessity based that yeah. you're not going to have people that are available to to perform the work and you know there are certain aspects of construction that will lend themselves toward automation. Yep, and also lend themselves to man- to to this type of a manufacturing and modularization form uh, form of construction. And you know, so you're going to see this hybrid develop o- uh, over time. So what's your what's your prediction? Your world's going like, to end. No, really. I mean, oh, you're okay. 78, 79 years old. How how how? <laughs> How long? And you're you... about 300, but that's in dog <laughs> years. So okay. How long can you expect? I mean, I'm a little bit younger than you. Can, will yeah, I be able to? Much. No, you're dead. You're going to be. That's gone what I'm saying. Will week. I be out of work you're... in in five? I ten just years. heard that. No, you're done. Because, <laughs> because, because I think that's the worry. I think, again, from a labor standpoint, there is a shortage. But wh- why would you want to be attracted to an industry if you think that it's dying? Right? It would be like you and I saying, you know "This what? isn't." Well, I want to be a fucking. Um, Blacksmith and shoe horses, right? Well, there is, there are still furriers. There are, you know, or farriers, I should say. There are furriers, fur too, trappers. Farriers. Yeah. No, I mean it's you know just the same way there are still buggy whips made. Not a hell of a lot of them, but you know, I don't this know what is... a buggy whip is. That sounds like it's for the bedroom. And that would be your bedroom along with something else, but we'll leave that alone. <laughs> um, so, but now the the. As far as as far as the industry is concerned, you're not going to see. I don't think you're going to see a, decl- the, a, a real declining need for skilled labor. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, but I mean, it's it, it. Again, it goes back to just if you don't have people that enter the if you don't have people that are entering the markets, and to say that why they would look at this as a dying market i don't think it is by any stretch i mean this is in the construction industry when uh, you consider again just the needs for the built environment over the next 20 to 50 years yeah uh, the demand's going to be there and and so it's and you've now after oh you know after the downturn in 08 09 and so on 
so many people left the industry yeah. that there's a legit shortage yeah. at this point. And, it, and that's not going to be relieved anytime soon. Yeah. And so, you know, you can make a damn good buck in this business, and, uh, and it's also pretty rewarding, too. We're, we're going to make a lot of efforts on that to attract different folks, young folks especially, to our yeah, industry. Yeah, absolutely. A- according to a McKinsey & Company report, cons- the construction industry overall, the productivity has not risen dramatically at all since the 40s. That would be what the 1840s or yeah, 1940s. <laughs> ah, so I okay. mean, in, well, no, the, well, the, with some of the things I've seen, it could be the 1840s, Not, and that goes very much to the to my point of there's there's going to be a there's going to start to be pressure on this. We don't have the bodies to be able to accomplish the work, and right. so out of necessity, you're going to start to see innovation, and you're going to start to see. Ad- uh, adaptation uh, take place. It, it will really be interesting to see what the future holds. Nobody has a crystal ball. But... God willing, we live to see it, yes. <laughs> right. Well, again, I, I will. But you know, I'm just... <laughs> 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 yeah, I wouldn't put a lot of money on that, but that's okay. The, the sub point to that report also <laughs> is, is that 98% of large construction projects are over budget. We, we don't have to. Those are projects you're involved in, I yeah. understand. Well, we but... don't, and you too. <laughs> Right, yeah, I well, think I saw make, a Maserati. Somebody's got to make some money. You know? <laughs> so you're wearing a polo sweater tonight, Mike, while I'm wearing my my standard Hanes T-shirt. Well, you know, <laughs> well, we'll 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 run a little Kickstarter for you then, and go from there. Go, go yeah. fund me. Go we're fun, gonna do a yeah, go, go fund me page yeah. for for new undershirts. Yeah, there you can go. Wear. Maybe an upgrade to Food of the Loom. Ah, uh, not going there. Okay, so. Continue on with smart equipment. Yes. Um, Kona Crane has just developed an S-type uh, bridge crane. Okay. Okay. And it's working off of synthetic rope versus cable. And synthetic rope has been around for a long, long time. Um, you, you talk with some of the people out there from Cortland and some other companies that manufacture the synthetic rope. Mm-hmm. It's been used in the offshore industry for a long time, and you would you would arguably say, "Wow, that's a pretty specialized place to trust in a synthetic well, yeah, fiber you rope." Would, you would also think that that's about as hostile an environment as you're going to get. And if it works there, why wouldn't it work elsewhere? So that's it. What's the question? Is again, when synthetics came on the market, just as far as synthetic slings, whether mm-hmm. it's polyester, Kevlar, nylon, right? There was apprehension. Right. The people felt safe with steel, with with wire rope slings. So what? Why? Why do you think it's going to take this long? Even though that's been in the industry for well over thirty some years yeah. in the offshore well, industry. Well, again, this goes back to you know when you look at it and you say, well, the productivity isn't improved since the nineteen forties. This has been an industry worldwide that has really been slow to adapt. Yeah, uh, any type of new technology. And so it's kind of the old, you know, this is the way we've always done it, and we know it works. Which is you know. bullshit, which probably adds that yeah, productivity well, number. Well, it, it, right, yeah. I mean, it definitely impacts the productivity number. And I mean, and it, but it also goes toward, um, pardon me, just the, uh, uh, you know, I mean, just the overall use and deployment of technology that you see, that it's... Um, it's a pretty staid, very, very conservative uh, industry overall, and it's relied more on labor than than it has in terms of trying to uh, adapt technology. And part of it is it's not easy. It ain't easy to figure out how to how to apply automation to these things. Have, have, but you, have you seen have you seen synthetic rope being used on a crane of any type? Not to the best of my knowledge. And and yet that's that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to almost give this stuff away as a prototype to say, T- try this. It's it's either on, easier on your shivs. Again, you won't have the wear and tear mm-hmm. that you do from a wire rope. You're not going to have the twisting of the torque effect. And that and that's one of the things that makes the the new hoist. Uh, there's a nice YouTube advertisement about it um, coming on the market, and they talk about having a, a tilted drum that that lessens the stress. They talk about as the rope goes through the shivs, again, you don't really have that D-to-D ratio like you would on a, a normal cable hoist. Um, so the durability is there 
as well. And now couple that again, going back to the, the, the smart equipment, right. is that hoist will be able to tell you when it needs to be recertified, when the brakes are, are starting to get low. And so ultimately, it's going to keep people much, much safer, um, right. even, even to the point where you know, it can sense if you're sideloading it. And hmm. we see okay. that all the time. Right. You see somebody that, that will take that and will attach to a load and literally drag it and not really understanding what's, what's kind of happened up there. Right. Right. And that's the last thing you want. So I'm really excited about this hoist because I think that maybe, maybe that might be exactly what we need is for people to build confidence by seeing an actual hoist in use with, with a synthetic rope. Yeah, I, and I would tend to agree with that. I mean, I think that you need some some form of a success to be able to build off of, no yeah. pun intended. And so you intended a pun. I'll be quiet. Um, the uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> giving away my secrets. Um, the uh, you know, but again, and that has been a big part of it is that you know it's like no, we know this works. We've yeah. done it like this way forever so we're just going to continue on and let somebody else prove it out let somebody else be the beta test on it and so i you know i mean as this as this begins to evolve yeah you know i mean i i can see where it's going to be you know i mean it could well be the be the thing to take over and uh, the, the first one through the door is gets bloody but in this case i have not heard of any accidents um in seeing a demonstration of some of the plasma rope that's used you know, they're now marketing, whether it's round slings or eye-to-eye -eye slings. And you can literally cut this rope and splice it yourself from the field. Wow. So t tell me that how that's not going to be of a use, right? Right. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, you still got to trust that the guy that's doing the splicing knows what the hell of he's doing. Of course, there's I'd... a fucking class for it. You're <laughs> yeah, not just well, going to give it to, you know, the guy yeah, well, over there with... I'd make sure he... Looked like, like Marty Feldman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Mar you got Marty Feldman eyes. The, uh, um, isn't that an old song, was it? No, that was, sorry, that was something else. Betty Davis eyes. You're thinking but, of Angel uh, Eyes by Eric Carmen. You are one strange dude. Angel <laughs> Eyes. Okay, if you're going to sing, I'm out. <laughs> That's it. There's there's certain things I just won't put up with. So, and that's one of them. So, All right. So, so, okay, I'll put you on the spot. Would you stand underneath a load, even though you're not no, supposed to? No, I would not. So you you so even you have some apprehension with synthetic rope. There's a reason my middle name is Thomas. I don't. You know, it's one of these things I basically trust no one. So, you know, it's like, no, I'm not standing under a load. I don't care who did it. You trust me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> you go with that. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, Imagine no. someone reaving a crane. Well, I mean, how long does that take when you, when you have right. to well, no, no, a crane right. versus, yeah. again, synthetic? Right. Well, oh. I mean, in terms, right, just, I mean, the weight that you're dealing with and everything else, I, there's there's tremendous advantages to it. It's going to, I mean, it's, I think it's going to prove out, um, again, it's not like this stuff was invented last week. It's no. been around, It's, and particularly with having seen as much time in the marine and offshore as it has, right. again, you would think that it'd be more universe, uniformly um, accepted. But part of this, too, goes to the standards, you know, to the uh, standards body. So this is ASME. This is ANSI. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and this is also going to be what's acceptable under uh, various safety guidelines and standards. So, you know, there's, there's a certain evolution there that's got to take place, and that's got to start to change now, for it to be accepted. As you know, I'm, I'm on a couple of the subcommittees for ASME B30. Right. Right? 30.30 is ropes, is synthetic ropes. Mm -hmm. And now all of the other additions have to incorporate them, right, into their additions. Right. So when you have a hoist that has wire rope, now we have, with Kona Crane coming on the market, we have to make that decision, Do we be pro uh, should we be proactive and start adding that language in there? And that's exactly what they've been doing. They've been working at that because they, they've seen the writing on the wall for the last year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. It's it's coming to market and it's not going anywhere. Right, but it, there's still you know there's still a length of time here to propagate all of this stuff, and then once it's officially allowed, 
or has been, you know, ordained by the standards groups and everything else, yeah. you're still going to have this education issue to go out into the field and start to train people and prove to them that, yeah, this stuff is viable, it is safe, and, yeah, you can use it much, you know, much more easily than what's been used for the last hundred years. And it's it's a tough message when you're still trying to tell guys not to use a fucking sling with a rope in it or with, yeah, a, with right. a knot in it yeah, or, exactly. or a tear. Or yeah, it's right. right. Yeah. It's all right. I'm just going to go home and tow some trees yeah. around the backyard. <laughs> I got duct tape. Don't worry about it. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. So it's, so, yeah, it's going to be a big challenge. It's And, and it's going to take time. Maybe I should become a synthetic rope salesperson and that could be my new calling call it whatever you want right yay um that i think i think is there anything else you need to add because if not that's going to lead us to to our segment this week of companies that kick ass okay kick away this 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 week's candidate or winner i should say is winner winner (laughs) is ness campbell crane and rigging um, th- these folks, I've had a chance to, to, to meet these guys and I have they, no idea where they are. No, of they've course got, I know well, they've they got, are. they've got a couple of no, locations, no, Seattle, they're... Portland. They've got a great culture, great leadership, great, great owners. Absolutely. Um, they practice safety and this, this project, great supporters of SCNRA. That, that is true. Um, that's a nice plug. That is a nice plug for, for sponsorship as well. Um, for SC, from <laughs> SCNRA. Yes. Joel. Jason. So what Beth. makes this project Beth. special? This is a this is a transportation <laughs> right type. And what they did is they had a two hundred and ten thousand pound transformer. Okay. In our world that could be heavy, that could be light, but the way and the scope of the work what they had to do was was pretty challenging. So the the first thing they did was they had to transport it off the rail car. Mm-hmm. Right. A lot of these are so heavy that that's how they get brought in. They jack right. and slit it onto their specialized uh, transporter, which was a, a, a dual lane trailer with, with three prime movers, okay. okay? And they had to go 17 miles once once they got to the job site. They first had to travel from the rail 25 right. miles, and then they get to this logging road. The logging road is muddy, it's filthy, there's tight corners. And so this is a tough job. So when they bid this, they were the only ones that, that could do this because they didn't, they didn't have to transfer loads to different carriers in between. Right. They, they just had to load it on once, and boom, they're gone. So they went up this 17-mile winding road full of mud where, in certain cases, the trailer was exactly as wide as the road. Um, they went over bridges that, you know, I mean, how old are some of these bridges? Right. They, they probably don't have a, a huge limit as far as a ton capacity. But again, you and I both know that 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 load gets spread out quite a bit mm-hmm. with, with all the multiple axles and tires um, working with grades up to 12 percent. Um, they had a company that had to help them uh, at one point pushing, pushing the uh, trans transformer with a bulldozer to get it back in line. So this wasn't just Ness Campbell Crane. And we're going to and we're going to have. You know, you'll see the pictures um, that we're adding on here. Um, they, they give a lot of the credit to uh, the site owner uh, and construction company uh, of RES, uh, Mountain Crane, uh, who still had to get other pieces up the hill mm-hmm. afterwards. So a lot of these guys were, were standing outside watching as they're going up the hill because lessons learned, right? Right. What, what not to do <clears throat> or what to do, to do in this case. Yes. Right. Um, they they love taking on this this challenge. They said they would absolutely do this again. Uh, the customer who uh, was was Siemens and HLI were very happy. They're even going out to thank RES, the county sheriffs, Columbia Rail, and then I like this one. This one's good. Credit out to Goodfellow Brothers Construction. Now, like I wouldn't mess with those guys just based on the name, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it'd be more good fellas, but uh, right. Uh, those yeah, yeah, there you go. Don't, funny, funny yeah. how their yeah. Yeah, okay. their aging report is is one day. Yes. <laughs> so you you see from the pictures again, this is a really <clears throat> fantastic job, and they should be honored for this um, because they had the equipment, they had the ingenuity, they had the the, the staff, 
and take a take a guess of how many employees they had to do this. Just uh, Ness Campbell. No idea. Six. Wow. From start to finish, six. That's and it, it took them 10 hours to get up that 17-mile hill. That's not surprising. But, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. But to have only had six people involved in this thing, that, that yeah. I find surprising. But that, that's and, tremendous. And I'm no mathematician, but that is. No, and you don't play one on TV either. Exactly 1.7 miles per hour average. So you you right. did the math. You carried the two. And My grandma okay, there could you walk go. faster than that. But again, yeah. I don't is, know. I've seen your grandma, and it's not pretty. But sorry about My that. My grandmas have been dead for years, and that's just very creepy. It's probably why they don't move that fast. <laughs> but <laughs> so again, uh, congratulations to uh, to Ness Campbell Crane and Rigging for being the uh, this week's uh, companies that kick ass. There you go. Um, with that, um, I think we're going to wrap up this uh, this this episode. Uh, Mike, is there anything you want to say out to the fine folks, the viewership out there? Not anything that can be said in fair company. You can so. say anything you want. No, there's, no, there's, no. There's no FCC. No. <laughs> this, I mean, in America. Won't let me be. Sorry. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Um, yeah, thank, thanks again for, um, you know, for all the information, the research that we're given here to, to support you know, our discussions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can find us on all the social media outlets. We're going to have these. Even uh, a few that haven't been invented yet. Even the few that have not been invented. That's right. Um, we're we're going to go to our, check out our website. Right. At, at ringingawesome.com, as well as our Facebook page. So, again, uh, great talk with you, Mike. Likewise, Pat. We will, uh, we'll check you in another week or so. There you go. I love you. I love I'm you. not going that far. Okay. I kind of like you, but okay. maybe. I'm not sure. Okay. That's Reading Awesome, featuring Pat Clark and Mike Walsh.